Welcome to episode eight of the Corbett Real Estate Insider Podcast. We have a really awesome show today, a lot of interesting topics to cover. We're going to be spending the majority of the episode talking about how to navigate really tough situations. These are unusual situations that brokers and directors of real estate find themselves in and may sit there and go, gosh, how do I optimize this decision? This is really unusual. There's high consequence of uh, any outcome that we pursue here. What do we do? So excited to dive into that, share our opinions on a handful of these different topics that we've sourced from a number of brokers and a number of directors of real estate. Uh, before we do that, as usual, we're going to be jumping in and talking about news stories from the last couple of weeks, uh, starting with Owen, who has a great story he wants to kick us off with. Yeah, not so much a public news story, but a news story nevertheless for commercial real estate. I think it's indicative of what's going on in the world right now, much of which is somewhat being reported, but not necessarily all of it. So I've got a client that I'm working with um, about it with the potential, uh, what could be a lease renewal um, if they don't choose to vacate the building. And in this world right now, given what's going on with the capital markets and with interest rates and so forth, we're ever mindful of the health of landlords. And it's the first time in many years where, you know, in, in the past, you know, landlords are always underwriting our clients, right? Like they're looking at our clients' financials and adjusting security deposits based on perceived risks. And now it's incumbent upon us to really underwrite the landlords and make sure that they have liquidity um, and the financial strength to honor the terms that we're negotiating. And so I'm working on this transaction with a landlord that owns um, lots of buildings and dug into the capital stack of, of the portfolio of buildings that are tied to a specific loan. And it was interesting to uh, when I, what I uncovered, which is that this portfolio of buildings that, this, that my client's one building happens to be located within uh, is a $125 million loan, which uh, was uh, initiated about eight years ago. It's a 10-year IO, interest-only loan at 3.9%, expiring in the spring of 2025, uh, which is about the time my client's lease expires. Now, beyond that, what gets scary is that um, that portfolio of buildings that this loan is uh, associated with is right now 27% vacant. So much, much different landscape than it probably was um, when the loan was issued eight years ago. And so the concern that we have um, and what we're doing to protect our client and be aware of is that the, this landlord's ability to refinance this building is going to be very difficult. Um, and very likely, they will have to contribute more equity to bring the loan to value uh, ratio to 50-50 or even possibly better um, in order to get the financing. And not to mention the fact that rates, you know, just a couple of years ago would have been give or take 4%, maybe less. Um, now for this type of asset, given that they're all office buildings are going to be pushing kind of nine or 10%. And so the question is, is like, is this even, is this like someone just not even willing to catch that falling knife? I don't know. Um, but we're making sure that if we do indeed re- decide to renew, we've got protection in the lease, some of which we talked about on a previous podcast, um, to make sure the landlord honors the obligations and we have rights to kind of self-help, so to speak, uh, if things aren't honored, but uh, really, like this is the stuff that's not being reported. You're not going to see this in the, you know, periodicals that you read online, but it's a reality. And if you have the data and you have the knowledge to to uncover the capital stack in these buildings, it's a pretty drear picture. Um, I don't have a crystal ball. I can't say definitively what's going to happen, but um, just think about that: a 3.9 percent interest only loan due in two years, um, with a portfolio of buildings that is, you know, only about 70 percent occupied. Uh, where rates are going to be pushing nine or ten percent, I just don't see how these things get refinanced if these landlords don't pump additional capital in to rebalance the loans. Yeah, this is a really interesting uh, scenario to find yourself in, and one of the tough scenarios that we're going to be talking about once we get through the news. The other thing that I want to mention is that the vast majority of news articles that you read will talk about a bank's exposure to office commercial real estate loans. Right? If you read any of these articles, it will say. Well, uh, you know, PNC Bank only has 3%. I'm, I'm making this up, right, as an example. Only has 3% of their uh, commercial real estate loan exposure is for office space. And 
people will then look at that and be like, oh, okay, well, everything's safe. They only have 3% exposure to office space. And we all, of course, know that office space is having the most significant correction in terms of asset values, because not only are you being hit by the you know tightening uh, monetary supply, higher interest rates, but you also have this uh, occupancy phenomenon that didn't exist before COVID. But these other product types are still impacted by rising interest rates and um, more limited supply of debt capital. Um, and these these buildings, I, I would argue that, of course, office space uh, loan exposure is worse than having industrial or retail or hospitality loan exposure, of course. But I would argue that loan exposure to any type of commercial real estate that wasn't conservatively financed is in a very challenging spot, a very, very challenging spot. So even though Owen's example here is talking about office space, if that were a hospitality property or were an industrial property in a market where maybe rents haven't gone up dramatically over the last couple of years, then you still could find yourselves in a, in a challenging spot where there's maybe a portion of the equity wiped out. You know, Certainly not all of it if you're an industrial building, um, unless rents haven't grown at all, in which case you may find yourselves in a similarly tough situation. Morgan Stanley... Uh... Uh, came out with some research on this topic. There's $3.9 trillion of commercial real estate loans outstanding, of which they predict 50% of them will expire by the end of 2024. So across all asset classes, we've got a major problem from the refinancing perspective that, that will touch all different types of real estate. Yeah, I've got I've got some news. I had a different news story I was going to share. And then, I, and then I watched 60 Minutes last night. So my news story is about the 60 Minutes AI coverage which I don't know if any of you watched that or saw that, but like mind blowing really to just begin to grasp where we are actually. Like we all, I think we all knew this, we all know this, but to see it spelled out in the way that it was, to see what some of these AIs are doing makes me realize that we are in a period of exponential growth. Things are accelerating at an accelerating rate. And I don't know if you've ever heard the analogy of the chessboard, but I feel like we're on the back half of the chessboard where, you know, the, the, the uh, parable where you, if I give you a dollar starting and then I double it on each square, right? The first 32 squares gets you up to like over $2 billion, but it's the back half of the chessboard where the doubling is so profound. By the time you get to square 64, it's like over nine quintillion dollars. That's six commas. So we're on the back half of the chessboard and why this is relevant, what's well, going to be relevant for all of us in our lives in ways that we can't predict today. But for example, office use, knowledge work, like what happens when we don't need coders going in and sitting side by side with bench seating and coding all day long? If AI is going to do the coding, what are those office workers pivot to? Like, I think just wait. And it's going to come quicker than any of us realize. I think it's really going to profoundly affect our lives and the way we use office buildings and what we what we do when we go into work. Yeah, I think I think the and this came from uh, something a while ago. But what kind of struck me around this whole topic was imagine that so these AI technologies, their data set. If you think about if you think about how it works, right? They're pulling data from other sources. Their data set is every piece of information that has ever been on the internet ever and they can pull it in real time it's just a fascinating topic to me that that uh, is just so powerful okay but on watching 60 minutes the ai that's currently running isn't connected to the internet it's a fixed data set they haven't turned it loose on the internet yet buckle up <laughs> exactly yeah, it is interesting to think about what's the long term ramification on office space. I mean, of course, that's a lot less interesting than uh, what's the long term impact on how people work and whether they can you know, derive a livelihood from their current skills. And something that I think about often is there's been so many of these technological uh, paradigm shifts in our lifetimes, certainly a lot more than there were in the lifetime of somebody that was born in the 1800s or 1900s or even in 1950, right, that really just changed the face of the planet. And when you think about that, I think it's important to, to remember that all of these prior technological changes have resulted in 
significantly greater productivity and in, in many cases, similar or even higher levels of employment, right? So if you think about, you know, the printing press or advanced farming techniques or, you know, cars or all of these different things that have happened in, um, you know, the recent history of the, you know, last couple hundred years, obviously printing press much earlier than that. But you start thinking about that and you really wonder, is this really the event that has been sort of promised the, hey, we're going to need universal basic income because 60, 70 percent of the population is going to be unemployed? I'm not convinced that it is. I think history has shown us time and time and time again that increased uh, technology, increased productivity for the economy is you know, net, net good and that there will be other new jobs that emerge. And of course, I have no idea what those jobs are. I don't think many people do, but I, I, I don't think that this is the, you know, humans are now a species of leisure only and don't need to do any work because there's no work for them to do. I don't think that we're, we're there yet, but I don't know if, if ever there was a time where we were there, I suppose it would be now, but is it now? I don't know, to be determined, I suppose. Yeah, and if, if you look back, I mean, you make the point perfectly, Tucker, but if you look back in history, I remember a presentation on this, or a podcast, you look back in history, and at every kind of those those tipping points of history, right, the Industrial Revolution, the invention of the, the printing press, or, or the invention of the internet, there was always this kind of mass hysteria around, oh, this is going to eliminate all these jobs, the economy is going to go in the tank, there's how all these people are going to need new careers. And it does just the opposite. It builds a bigger base. It creates more opportunity and employment and a better, a better quality of life for people. So uh, if history is to repeat itself, which in many cases it does, I think, I think you're hundred percent right. This is going to create just a bigger swimming pool that we're going to find new ways to innovate. And all the people that are doing X today are going to do Y tomorrow, better, faster, and bigger. Yeah. It's, you know, I, I haven't seen the piece on 60 minutes. I heard about it from others as well, John. Um, and there's absolutely no doubt that AI is going to change the way, you know, we work as a society worldwide. Um, but I also recognize that it's a really, really easy piece for the media to kind of hype up and, and garner attention. So that's not to dismiss the enormity that AI is going to have on society. Um, but I think it's somewhat akin to like the hysteria of uh, Y2K or, you know, global warming, like we're all going to be underwater soon. Again, I, I don't, I'm not dismissing the fact that the world's getting warmer, but I think there's just a lot of, you know, um, selling, so to speak, just to garner interest and clickbait, so, so to speak. So, um, yeah, it's going to have a huge impact on the world, but it's, I don't think we're all going to be, uh, sitting in chairs like the, the movie Wally, if anyone's seen that movie and being, <laughs> um, kind of, just automatrons on a universal basic income doing nothing all day long. So we'll, we'll see what happens. I'm excited for it. One of the things I find fascinating is the AI is only as good as the training data. And there's a lot of areas in the economy that have essentially no training data. And I would argue that one of those areas is commercial real estate. Very, very limited training data exists, particularly on the leasing of commercial real estate side. I mean, imagine your a kid graduating from college trying to learn more about real estate brokerage, uh, there's really no way to do it. I mean, uh, not not to be self-promotional here, but like the, uh, our podcast of just what we've done is probably dominates the, you know, top, you know, thousand hours of content on the internet that's valuable for somebody to listen to trying to get into this industry. And that's not to say that, oh my gosh, our podcast is so amazing or something. There's just nothing out there. I mean, there's such little information that exists beyond these, uh, you know, books that brokers have written that's like how to make a ton of money in commercial real estate, which that's, that's not training data to make you good at doing brokerage or train in AI to be able to help a director of real estate make great decisions. For now, that data just doesn't exist. And I don't see that data being uh, made made public in a wide format. Um, you know, very similar to you know CoStar releasing, right? We've talked about this on the podcast that there were times where brokers thought, well, what am I going to even do if all the information is on the internet? How am I going to provide value? So it will be interesting to see how AI impacts uh, brokerage and corporate real estate. 
director decisions and company strategy uh, for at least the time being. I don't think that there's enough training data to have an AI that is intelligent enough to make decisions. Um, the other point that I wanted to make is that in many of these professional service industries, I think that uh, these AI engines are simply going to make those businesses much higher margin uh, and that they aren't going to disintermediate. So a lot of people are talking about, uh, you know, GPT-4 specifically for uh, legal services. I think the overwhelming amount of people are still going to hire an attorney because they will not trust a AI to do a simple form. And they're going to want to make sure that the information they're requesting is the best way to do it. Uh, on the back end, that attorney that's drafting a document using and leveraging AI properly probably will be able to get through that work crazy faster. So maybe, you know, these law firms end up employing less people and all of these attorneys are super productive. And instead of having, you know, a second or third paralegal, they have a prompt engineer helping them write, you know, their first draft. Uh, but I think the net net is that there's going to be a similar amount of work done by uh, very experienced professionals that, um, you know, are very knowledgeable about their skill set and that those people are just going to use AI to do their job uh, more quickly and more effectively than they do now versus consumers using AI themselves in very complicated fields. It's my own two cents here. And just to bring it back to the most basic concepts, which kind of is in line with what you're saying, Tucker, is like, imagine if I'm a farmer and I'm not a really good farmer, I get marginal results. Uh, my crops don't yield what other people's you know crops yield. I would probably want a subscription to chat, chat GPT to let it, you know, use weather models, um, you know, have knowledge of plants and seeds and when to, you know, sow my fields and so forth. I mean, it's like it could actually make us even more productive and chat GPT is not going to replace me, the farmer, um, if that's what I'm doing. It's just going to make me better. So there are certainly functions of society where it might might replace some certain things. But there's a lot of stuff I think is just going to make us more efficient and more productive. Um, yeah, so jump into another it, it, totally different but interesting article, um, news article I read over the over the weekend was around, um, they dug into, and I didn't know anything about it, found it interesting, the concept of trauma-informed design. So they talked about kind of three, three pillars or three aspects of it. Uh, no, it's five, sorry, five aspects of it. It's the sense of safety sense of community, sense of respect and dignity. Now, I think some of those, um, I think all of those are really important. Some of those kind of uh, can be extrapolated to our world, right? Commercial space. And uh, I think as companies start to look at who their employees over the next 20 to 30 years are, you're seeing, uh, you know, obviously increased rates of use of all sorts of drugs for trauma, right? So antidepressants, anti-anxiety, and you're seeing um, spiking rates of cases of, of lots of trauma-induced uh, illness and disease. So why are we not focusing more on how we can create an environment? And I think, uh, you know, starting with where the office is located, how the building is designed, uh, how, you know, how the finishes are um informed around the, the new type of worker that you're going to have in the space. So I thought it was a really interesting article. They were more focusing on uh, living in, in uh, community housing and, and th those aspects of, of the uh, industry. But I think it could be very quickly extrapolated into our industry and help, you know, help companies uh, find a better environment for the people that they want to attract back to the office. Okay, great news stories. Let's transition to the main topic today, navigating tough scenarios that you may find yourself in as a tenant in this very weird uh, state of the economy that we live in. First topic, which we already previewed with Owen's news story, is what do you do if your landlord is out of the money uh, on their equity? Maybe they have a, a debt obligation that's expiring in the next couple of years. Let's cover how do you go to the lender and get a deal done? Do you even do that? Do you deal with the landlord direct? Do you just pass on the building? What do you do if you have a lease that's expiring and your building's in receivership and you can't get a lease done because the landlord won't give you any TIs to stay? Then what do you do? Um, John, I know you wanted to talk about this first. Yeah, so what do I do? Um, I guess we got to get to the lender. 
Uh, they're the ones that really have the, uh, are going to be the owner of the building. It's a, the servicer. Um, it's not going to be fun. Uh, but I think I saw Owen raise his hand. If you've got ideas, Owen, I'm all ears. Yeah, um, definitely talking to lender uh, is key. Um, but also just making sure we've got protections because, um, for example, in this case that I'm working on right now, uh, it's not just enough to have a non subordination and non-disturbance agreement. Um, we also are going to the extent that we're requiring that um, if the tenant improvements that are being discussed and contemplated are not completed by a certain date, or you know, we find out the landlord's not paying the contractors and the subcontractors, we have a right to self-help. Uh, we can pay those um, uh, fees and deduct it from rent that we owe. We're also requesting that all of these concessions go into escrow. Um, so we know that the money's there in the first place, so we don't even have to get to that point. Um, so there's all sorts of things we can do to protect our client, um, and that requires a lot of cooperation with the lender. Um, but if your client's large enough, and again, I want to be clear, this might be a little difficult to, to do in request on behalf of someone that might lease 2,000 square feet. But in this case that I'm talking about, this is a full floor tenant in a very large building with 35,000 foot floors. Um, it's critical for both the landlord and the lender to keep them um, if they can reach the terms that we're endeavoring to achieve. Uh, and so I don't think it's, well... You know, nobody wants to have these discussions and sometimes they're a little uncomfortable. Um, they're critical and it keeps the client from having to end up in a situation where they end up in a quagmire uh, of a, a complete mess and have space that's not functioning and not what they, you know, promised or, or otherwise wanted to have. Yeah, I, I would add to that. So, um, you know, to take a step back, I think I think that this industry is full of a lot of brokers that understand the the uh, the financial side of the business that supports owners and how owners look at real estate there's only a few um, that I know of many all of you on this podcast they really understand how tenants how commercial um, gap accounting gap finance works for companies and I think this is an opportunity right now, one, to, to start to really understand what are the drivers for a landlord on, in their financial side of the business and what are the drivers for a tenant. Because there are opportunities, one, to get ahead of this well ahead of, of a decision points for the owner, right? If you know when their debt is expiring, you got to get out ahead of it. You got to have a good team in place that understands the drivers for them and understand the drivers for the tenant. Three is there's ways to create a, a significantly decreased net present value for your client, which, which then would be straight lined and effectively be the rent, but also provide an owner with a future value of your of the lease that keeps either the lender in play because they don't have to um, write down the loan because the loan to value is sufficient that where they don't and could keep the equity in play. So you really have to understand it and you have to take a step back and look at the opportunity and do the math to make sure you're you're aligning the objectives because sometimes there's ways to structure deals that that provide uh, a win win for both sides. I think the other piece is, is you really have to have a team that understands this. Uh, you know, there's, there's uh, a lot of great brokers out there. There's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of smart people in this industry, but I would say 70 to 80% of them are strictly looking at this from the perspective of the owners and the financial firms that support them. Understanding how tenants look at this is the key in, in creating a win for your clients. Brian, another sub scenario of this topic not everyone has the ability to get way in front of this right there's a lot of companies that can't make real estate decisions two three years in advance and you know they might have 500 locations and they're not checking the debt on every single property of every single building that they have a lease in they're just literally trying to survive because they're understaffed and you know i know you you know this right um we see the this all the time with companies that we talk to that have a real estate department that is not set up to be strategic and they're more executing instead of winning and just, you know, trying to just get through the day instead of being really strategic. What do you do if you wake up to a lease that expires in 90 days, you're the director of real estate of a company, 
The CEO says, we absolutely need to renew this lease. Get it done as fast as you can. It's in special servicing. Everyone you talk to uh, is unresponsive. You try to get through, your brokers try to get through, you know, you've exhausted all efforts. Do you just let the lease expire and stay in the space? How do you think that the lender, once they become responsive, thinks about that? And what are the risks and the benefits to a company that decides to just say, hey, we're going to stay in the building. Yeah, we have this holdover provision, but we think we're going to be able to stay long term and not have to pay holdover rent. Yeah, it's funny. As you were describing that scenario, there's a name that popped into my head. It begins with our first name, last name, RR. I won't say his name, but I have to have called him, I don't know, 700 times for some clients because it, he works for a special servicer and he's the decision maker on some assets. And it happens. You can't get through to them. And I think at the end of the day, your client needs to put contingency plans. This is what we did. We put contingency plans in place in the event something happened at the building that didn't allow us to continue our operation. But what we, we also did was we continued to pay rent. If it was on a schedule and there was you know fixed increases, we just continued to pay those according to the schedule. Um, and we stayed in the building effectively on a month to month basis until it went through the wash and they were able to approach us. You just have to remember that the the um, the value of that asset, if you're a large enough tenant, is your tenancy. And at the end of the day, someone's going to own that building at some value. And it's all about the risk profile of the company that you're representing. And if you can't go through those things, make contingency plans, and also just continue to operate effectively month to month, you need to make a decision to get out of the building and move your operation. If it's a, you know, any type of uh, critical infrastructure, if it's any type of critical trading desk or something where, you know, if the, if the building goes dark, if there's a disruption of power or heat, HVAC, there's all these variables because at the end of the day, who's operating the building? A lot of times it continues to operate and there's no issues. And that's what happened in our case. But Having contingency plans where they could they could move the people to another location, they could go remote. We had a whole plan in place. We communicated to our people, and it took maybe a year to play out um, for this particular situation. And then we ended up renewing our lease when the building was under um, you know someone's control who could make decisions. Yeah, it's important to think through what happens after the restructuring process. Do they want your tenancy or not? almost always they will want your tenancy. And if you've already left, then that's you know a lose-lose for everyone if the tenant wants to renew. Another scenario that I want to talk about before we sort of close out this you know landlord default and start talking about some of these other scenarios is what do you do if you're caught in limbo? Um, I'm sure we're going to have people that listen to this that signed a real estate deal without doing diligence on who the owner is and what their capital stack and ability to perform looks like that then fails to perform, uh, perhaps through no fault of the landlord themselves, but through a default of the landlord's lender, right? There's all kinds of scenarios where even good landlords can be put in bad situations where they can't perform. What do you do if you sign a lease and there's um, a certain amount of landlord work before they turn it over to the tenant? It could either be, think, a new construction building where the landlord's delivering the core and shell, uh, and then you're responsible for the tenant improvements. It could be um, you're leasing 5,000 feet in a multi-tenant building on a full floor, and they need to demise the space into like your specific premises, uh, and maybe you know pull some of the building services and stub them out into a you know closet in your space, something like that. What do you do if the landlord hits a financing snag or a snag of any kind and isn't delivering your work? Um, I would love to talk about you know, uh, what you do in that situation. And then let's also talk about how do you make sure that you're never in that situation? Because of course, if you know what to ask for, there's ways to avoid this with terminations and rent penalties and the ability to self-perform work and all that. But if you find yourself in one of these awful situations, what do you do? I mean, Tucker, can't we flip this around? I'm, I don't know if there's anybody more informed on this right now, given some of the specialized nature of the, the deals that you're doing for your clients that's that's living and breathing this. So what, what's your take on it? Because our conversation, you were you were all over this and it was a great, uh, a great discussion. 
Yeah, f fortunately, I'm not in this exact situation with anyone. Uh, you know, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, right? And have spent a uh, perhaps uh, like obsessive amount of time making sure that none of our clients get into this situation. So I, I haven't dealt with the scenario where, you know, active client that the landlord won't deliver the tenant improvements on time. Of course, there's 100% been scenarios where, um, like I, I'm in fact dealing with this right now. Um, landlord is very delayed in delivering, uh, um, you know, a space to our client. Um, I, this is actually happening all around the country. If you're trying to get specialized electrical switch gear for a new development, literally there are six month, 12 month delays that are affecting everyone. If you have any type of specialized electrical switch gear, which most advanced manufacturing companies using a large amount of power are going to have specialized or custom switch gear. Um, and all of it has just been massively delayed. And the, the key on these transactions is don't let yourself be in that situation. You know, make sure that one, you order the switch gear extremely early or whatever that, you know, uh, that critical path item that's going to cause the, the delay. Think through what is that going to be and make sure that there's language in the lease that requires the landlord to buy that switch gear very early on. Like within 30 days of signing the lease, they have to provide proof of order in order uh, or otherwise tenant has the option to terminate. I mean, you can negotiate things like that in the lease. But the biggest thing that you can do, uh, particularly in a weird supply um, chain type of environment, is make sure that the lease is very closely aligned uh, between the landlord and tenant's interests, right? Say that you uh, were negotiating a deal, and we talked about this on the creative uh, you know, lease structuring podcast. Say you're negotiating a deal and there's, you know, Two, there's two buildings. There's one building that's move and ready. And then there's another building that's new construction. They're right next to each other. And it's the same landlord. And I'm just making up this example. This probably wouldn't happen often, but for illustrative purposes, make sure that the commencement date for both buildings is tied to the completion of that one building. Then you're sitting there and the landlord's saying, I get no rent at all, even on this completed building until the new construction building is done. And that might be an extreme example, but if the la if you know the landlord is intensely aligned and any time that they're delayed, it's going to cause a crazy amount of uh, expense or opportunity cost of revenue for them. That's that, that's how these deals should be structured. The key here is really making sure you don't get into that situation in the first place by making sure you have protections in the lease. That said, going back to the initial question, what do you do if you find yourself in this situation right now? I really think that is more a question for a real estate attorney than it is for a broker. I mean, that's the first thing that I would do is get counsel involved, look at what are our options here. Uh, if you're inheriting a really bad lease, maybe you make a strategic legal decision to just say, hey, we're terminating the lease, you failed to perform, we're out of here. Um, yeah, but that's definitely something that's more for uh, a real estate attorney to opine on than all of us. I think it's a great point. I think one one other strategy that I was thinking about on this topic, and it, you can't do this for the larger uh, you know, business, I guess they're all business critical, but for the larger, more complicated and truly business critical facilities, it's a, this is more difficult. But for a commodity and kind of your secondary or tertiary locations, I've been trying to get landlords to do turnkey, right? Because it puts all the delivery risk on the landlord. And they're going to, you know, the pricing risk to a certain extent can be shared. They're not going to take all the pricing risk, but they're going to take some of it. If you're not doing scope changes, they should be uh, committed to the budget, the, you know, the budget that they're coming up with and they go to market and price, right? That, that GMP contract. But with, with there's so much uh, unknown in delivery, I've been trying to flip a lot of deals to turnkey because it puts all the delivery risk on them and their contractor, not us. Yeah, the um, I'm with you there. I've done a tremendous amount of turnkey deals in the last 12 months for those exact reasons, Brian. So like minds think alike. Um, the one thing that you, I know you know this, but just for our listeners that you have to be really careful about is that when you're building turnkey, um, my concern is that there's always some ambiguity if you don't have fully baked CDs. And rarely does a tenant have fully um, prepared CDs, construction drawings. Uh, when they go to lease. Um, I have one case right now where we're concerned that the landlord's going to try and cut corners. So the tenant opted to self-fund um, 
the cost of the construction drawings, and we are able to be we will we will be reimbursed uh, with the TI allowance um, or the turnkey rather allowance when and if we sign the lease. So there's a little bit of a speculative um, cost that we had to deal with, but we felt much safer having actual CDs as an exhibit to the lease. But if you don't, there's still ways to document that pretty pretty clearly with a a space plan and you know multiple page work letter. Uh, that outlines exactly all the finishes and the level of those finishes. So I just say that to our listeners out there because turnkey is easy to say, hey, turnkey, I'm going to have this many offices and this and that. Um, And it sounds good, um, but I just, I'm always mindful of the fact that anywhere there's ambiguity, you're providing an opportunity for those providing the turnkey to cut corners and save costs that might be different than what your clients expect. What do you do if the turnkey doesn't deliver on time though, right? It's a great strategy to shift all the risk onto the landlord, but how can you be confident that the landlord is going to act with the same urgency that perhaps a, a tenant representative would, like a tenant construction representative would, if they're sitting there saying, hey, our manufacturing line and deliver, uh, you know, delivering on our contracts with our customers depends on the space being done by X date. You're putting all the risk onto the landlord, but you're also putting all the responsibility of being timely on them too. Is that a risk that you're willing to take. I don't know. I think that's something that each company has to make really thoughtfully. Um, personally, I have way more confidence in, um, you know, like our construction management team or a third party construction management team that's been retained by the tenant itself that maybe has a success contingency for part of their compensation. I believe that they're going to be much more effective at delivering on time than the landlord will, generally speaking. So, um, well, I 100% agree taking the cost risk and the um, like schedule risk in terms of when you begin paying rent off the table by doing a turnkey makes a ton of sense. You definitely give up a lot of control around making sure that the space is done on time. 100% you do. And that's why I, th- I think you need to break your portfolio into kind of key, key chunks, right? So if it's a strategic location, it's larger and and more complicated, you want to likely want to own that. And, and for the reasons you spoke, but if it's, if it's more commodity and secondary space in a secondary market where you don't have good resources, you have people need to fly into there or you're finding third party resources in, you know, these markets, put it on the landlord. They have a team, they're mobilized, they work in that market. They know the subcontractors. They, if you set the contract up properly, you can you can get them likely to perform better. It's been my experience in, in handling this. And the other key part of this, and and this is this is both in a landlord's requirements to deliver a base building for you to you know to do the improvements, and also if they're doing turnkey, is you have to have a very strong set of key milestones in your LOI up front. Don't wait for the lease. One of them needs to be financing. One of them needs to be application for the permit the other one needs to be application for uh, or the the, the uh, submission of a contract with your contractor it needs to be around completion of the lease there's a there's a array of key milestones so you can front load if you see the landlord having an issue you can front load that and you have the ability to either course correct with the landlord and figure out what the problem is you know completion of the CDs completion of the design uh, drawings. Um, completion of the scope of work all in an LOI and have real dates to those. And if you do that, you can front load your issues so that you start to understand when schedule starts to creep and when there's issues, you can either hold the landlord's foot for the fire or if it could be your internal team in a lot of cases, if it's a design issue, it's your internal team, but you can start to course correct and know that there's downstream issues to it. But if you don't have it and you're just waiting till the end and you're you're allowing the landlord all this time and then at the end he comes to you with a, you know the bad news, you had all this, these months, months of, of schedule that you could have worked to try to figure out a solution to course correct that you wasted. Yeah, I, I would also add that the key is having those milestones very clearly defined and ideally having the right to terminate if they materially miss one of those dates and haven't cured or, or corrected the schedule. Um, in addition to that, which the option to terminate would be at you know the tenant's election only, right? In addition to that, Every time the landlord is late on these dates, there should be some sort of rent penalty to keep the parties aligned beyond just, hey, the commencement date is pushed out by a day, you know, for each day of delay. 
that, that doesn't i mean of course that delays rent being paid but the lease is just starting later it's still the same amount of rent being paid just on a slightly different schedule by the way it's not just a day um if they're a day late it forces me to extend my lease for another month where i'm at it's a, a day is a month every time yeah yeah good point okay let's jump to the next one uh this one is something that hopefully very few people will have to deal with ever but damage and destruction this is a provision in leases that a lot of people i uh, never think are going to come into effect i know that a couple of my other co-hosts have actually had this come into effect i have it is a terrible moment when you get that call from somebody saying that a tornado ripped half their building's roof off or you know a fire burned down their whole building what do you do if the landlord decides to rebuild right they say hey you know what based on the damage and destruction provision we think we can rebuild this in time sorry the lease is still in effect it'll resume in nine months when we're done with construction <laughs> what do you do if you're that company and you've got a business to run and you can't go find a new building uh on a long-term basis yeah what do you do i mean that's such a nightmare and that's when you're everyone's scrambling back and reading the damage and destruction. And did we pay attention to that when we were negotiating the lease? Because one time out of 100, that's going to happen. And all of a sudden, the language matters. And also, the use type matters. I mean, if it's an office space, you could go pick up some interim office space. Because you're not let off the hook of the lease. You just have to go do something else in the interim nine months. And maybe you can do that for an office use. But if it's a manufacturing use, hmm. And by the way, there's a key role for of insurance in, in these circumstances. But yeah, you're going to scramble and find an interim solution to try and make the best of the next nine months. It's a nightmare. We actually had this happen last year with a client uh, in Arkansas. And their distribution facility, multiple hundreds of thousands of square feet, was wiped out by a tornado. Um, I actually got a, a call. We were at the least we were out actually executing on a potential relocation. <laughs> and the listing broker for another uh, building called my colleague or my teammate here in the office at like 4 a.m. and was like, hey, turn on the news. Uh, <laughs> looks like we can accelerate you know, our transaction. And sure enough, it uh, had destroyed a, much of their building. Um, long story short, what we ended up doing was um, moving to another building temporarily. Landlord, luckily, the lease that uh, we had negotiated um, had strict... Um, timelines around how long they have to re repair the building. Um, and if they can't get it done in that period of time, we have the ability to terminate. Um, what ended up happening is uh, we did actually have the ability to terminate and exercise that and are proceeding with it in a different direction. It wasn't fun. And I don't think there's any situation where you can make it such where the building gets destroyed and, oh, no big deal. We'll just move across the street. Um, but it's important to have provisions in the lease that afford you the ability to terminate so that Landlord doesn't have an open-ended timeline to fix the building or even make it like 12 months. I was negotiating an office lease last month for a large client of mine. And they were asking me like, why is this that, you know, the building's not going to fall down. Like there's no tornadoes here. We don't, you know, and so forth. And I said, well, you know, there was a case um, a few years ago where a construction crane that was building a building next to another building uh, fell over. Horrible situation. You know, people died. Um, but the crane fell into a neighboring building. Um, half that building was kind of destroyed. And um, that's a great example, albeit incredibly unfortunate and awful. Um, but things can happen that are outside acts of God, so to speak, by Mother Nature. And so, again, like if you've got a, a lease that doesn't provide you the ability to walk away, the landlord says, hey, I can't get this done for a year. Um that's that's going to be a problem. So something to be very mindful of. I, I, here's one idea. Um, rather than having to go do an interim move, we can go do a more permanent move into another vacant building owned by the same landlord. Okay, let me make this a little bit more complicated. Uh, our listeners don't have the luxury of being able to go renegotiate their damage and destruction provision on you know all the leases that they already signed. Say you're in a position where you have a bad damage and destruction provision. You do not have the ability to terminate. Tornado hits your building. You have a complicated manufacturing line. You wish you weren't in this situation. How do you approach the landlord and I suppose your insurance company too to terminate the lease, to go to the landlord and say, 
We understand we don't have the legal right to terminate the lease. We can't reoccupy without putting our business at risk and our contracts at risk because of the cost to get a new in manufacturing line up and running. How do you approach that negotiation with the landlord in order to agree on a termination that's not uh, like by right driven, but you know through negotiations coming up with an agreement where both parties are incentivized to terminate the lease and move on? I would tell you, so my experience with a similar situation, um, it, it it isn't a real estate decision anymore. It's a business decision. And and ultimately, if they need to get their manufacturing line up and running and they don't have confidence that you could do it in that building, the real estate becomes the part, just go execute. get Because the business is worth more than the real estate. And the conversation with the landlord is really a legal conversation on on uh, you know how you protect damages to you, how much is left on the lease, and it becomes a much uh, a larger conversation around what's our risk profile with that landlord when he sues us for not paying rent. Because uh, at the end of the day, if you are in a critical location, you need to get your business up and running. Go do it, and and work with you know your legal department, work with your operations department, um, work with your senior leadership to put a team together to go do that because that is, you never want your business to be at the mercy of a landlord who's uh, moving at the pace that they're moving at and their insurance company is moving at to be able to run your business. It's just, it'll never work right for you. Well, at the risk of repeating myself. So first thing I would say is to, here we go again, proactively communicate, get on the line with the building owner, with your landlord, and make it clear to them so they understand the circumstance you're facing. Some version of pleading poverty, some version of like, this will kill the company. Um, we can't let that happen. We understand that you're being harmed as well. Uh, how can we work together so that we end up as quickly as possible in a building that you own, paying you rent somewhere else? Because it's not gonna happen here. I would tell you, hopefully before the day that the hurricane or the tornado takes your building down. I remember this got really, um, it kind of came to the forefront, unfortunately, after 9-11, but it's been a part of a, a good strategic real estate team and, and partners responsibility to work with their clients to come up with contingency plans and understanding the damage and destruction clause and your ability to remedy the any issues at your facility for your strategic locations should be part of a team's approach to running a portfolio. And it became a very uh, front and center issue after 9-11. And I remember building these policies and building these contingency plans, digging into existing leases, because you are, you, most real estate directors inherit, inherent, inherit <laughs> leases. Um, that you know are, are negotiated at a different time or with a different skill set and understanding those so you can quantify it and, and, and really just plan around it uh, is a key part. So if you don't have contingency plans in place and you have a poor damage and destruction clause in one of your critical facilities, it should get added to your list of priorities for uh, you know the next 90 days, I would say. And that's a key part of doing this is having having the communication plan in place, having the visibility in place. So if this happens, this is what we're going to do. Um, and that's a big part of the, you know, the, the value that a good team can add and a good real estate director. Okay. Moving on to the next topic. There is at, at least a couple uh, very large industrial real estate owners throughout the country. And I'm sure many other owners of all different types of uh, real estate product types that will not begin negotiations on a lease renewal with their tenants until the tenant has either uh, waived their renewal right or formally exercised the re renewal right, in which case it may be you know, arbitrated or whatever that says. What do you do if you have a key location, maybe rents have gone up a lot, you don't want to negotiate through the renewal option, you want to negotiate a market deal, at the same time that you're evaluating alternatives, what do you do? Do you waive your renewal option in order to get them to negotiate with you? Do you try and get them to agree to negotiate with you anyways? Uh, do you just exercise the renewal option? What do you do in a situation like that? You know when to start? The first thing you do is you hire a broker that isn't being, isn't representing that owner 
or, or looking to represent that owner on a future project. So you can have a true third party conversation with them. That's, that, that is the first and, and most important step in any of this. Let's say that you already have that person, Brian. You already have a you know non-conflicted real estate team. What do you do? I mean, how do you think about it? I mean, there's there's pros and cons. I mean, if you if you want to stay in the building, the highest probability path and the easiest lowest friction path are just exercising the renewal right. But there's obviously enormous benefits to being able to negotiate you know outside of it. It's a risk. Like how how do you evaluate that risk, John? It looks like you want to talk about this. Yeah, I've done this a number of times, and it's important to remember that it's not my risk tolerance, it's the client's risk tolerance. So my job is to map out as best we can what the risk profile looks like. Um, are we a small tenant or is there a large tenant next door? You know, the, the renewal option gives you rights to your space. Without the renewal option, you have no rights to stay in your space and the landlord might have something else they would prefer to do. So my job is to map out for you what we see in the context, what's the risk profile look like, and to let the client decide um, their tolerance for that risk. Also to map the upside, like here's the thing, they're, they're asking for $3 a foot, it's a $2 market, it's, it's not reasonable, the, your, your renewal option has bad language where it's fair market rent, but it won't go below the old rent and that's gonna be too high. Map it out, like what's, what's at risk? and what's to gain and let the client decide how much risk tolerance they have. But I think in order to get there, it's, and John, you're right, but that's like at the, that's, that's at the point of decision of do we exercise a renewal option or not? I think before you even get there, you need to decide like, what is our option? What are our options? Are there any? I mean, there are cases where I've been a part of transactions where there's extremely limited options and the risk of losing the space is actually pretty bad. Um, in the sense of like, it would be hard to replicate what my client may have um, without either going to an inferior building or a location that isn't, you know, desired. And so I think first and foremost, um, I agree, it's, it's a risk assessment, but in doing so, it's what are our options if this space is no longer available and what are those costs? Um, there are cases where I think I've done it twice in my career where I've had a client actually exercise a renewal option and in those cases, um, it, it was, we were thankful that we had really good provisions in terms of how we have determined market rent. But um, yeah, there's cases where I've seen tenants have to exercise because they have millions and millions of dollars of infrastructure invested into the building. And whoever might have represented that lease on when they went in didn't really spend too much time on the renewal option. Landlord realized they've had a very favorable option and forced the tenant to, to exercise. Um, so I get, yeah, it's, it's an absolute risk assessment. Um, but I think a good broker is going to help them get there and realize what their options are, whether it be to relocate or, or buy or, or renew. I have had a handful of clients that have actually waived their renewal option. I've also had a lot of clients where the landlord has a very strict policy of not negotiating on renewals until you've waived the renewal right, where we've been successful at getting the landlord to negotiate with us anyways. So I think you you need to look at the scenario uh, from a very high level, as Owen was saying, understand what your alternative options are, but you also need to think about what what's the strategy. I mean, for a lot of companies, their preference may be to renew, but they might not, you know, care enormously, right? They might not have that difficult of a relo to relocate of a you know location um, or a warehouse or manufacturing. I mean, obviously becoming progressively less likely as you move from office to warehousing to manufacturing. But if your client is sitting there saying, hey, I want to get the best possible deal I possibly can, and there are actually attractive relocation options, going to the landlord and waiving your renewal right is such a power move. I mean, it's such a show of confidence of like, hey, look, we know what we've got elsewhere. We're not going to renew on a on the renewal right because we know that it's not going to be a competitive deal and there's more competitive deals available to us elsewhere. It's such a power move that sets the tone for the negotiations that it can be a really effective strategy that these landlords don't even really realize can be a strategy. Um, I had one client that I really distinctly remember going through this because we deliberated on whether to waive the right over a long period of time. 
Uh, and we also tried numerous times to get the landlord to negotiate without us waiving the renewal option. We ultimately decided to waive the renewal option. They told me their strong preference was to renew, but if they had to relocate, they would. And we ended up relocating. We got such a compelling deal to relocate that it didn't make any sense. And had they exercised the renewal right, it would have cost them hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars over that particular lease term. So kind of finishing the thought here, I think before you waive that renewal right, the strategy that I would do is send that landlord a proposal and say, hey, look, we understand that you don't want to negotiate with us. Here are the terms we're willing to move forward at. Let us know in the next week. Otherwise, we're planning to move on. Um, that's a really effective strategy. Uh, and if they like the terms, they almost always will engage. Well, I love that. Um, and I also would add that there's been a, dozens of times over the course of my career, dozens and dozens, and I'm sure the same goes for the three of you, where I've had a client on an initial meeting to kick off an assignment, tell me, there's no way we're moving, we just want to renew, as if like it's a foregone conclusion. And respectfully, because they're asking me to lead, not just take orders, of course, um, my response is great, but allow me to create a competitive environment and at least give your chance, give yourself the chance rather, to fall in love with something else. I'm not saying it's gonna happen, but be open-minded because you might be pleasantly surprised with what we find. And there has been dozens of times where at the end of the transaction, you know, I, I, I chuckled to myself to think that, hey, you know, 12 months ago, 15 months ago, wherever it was, I, mean, I don't bring this up necessarily, but uh, you know, this client told me there was no way they were gonna move and they ended up moving. So um, I think that's a good, good point. I love that. I, I couldn't agree more. I use that exact um, phrasing where like, okay, I get it. You, we're not moving. And trust me, go into this with an open mind. And can I ask you a question? If hypothetically, if you if you did move, what might you do different? Right? If we start to tease out little compromises they've made with the current space, things that aren't optimal that they've just gotten used to over time, and probe that question, what would you do differently? Oftentimes you'll find that maybe there is something that could be better. Oh, I wouldn't mind having a building sign. I wouldn't mind having a not being on the ground floor. I wouldn't mind this or that. And I have one other idea for you where say you've got that industrial user uh, trying to negotiate ahead of the renewal option date. Um, can we create a circumstance to rationalize why we're into the landlord early? Because, oh, by the way, Mr. Landlord, the reason I'm coming to you now is because we've got this building that's a build a suit that's really attractive to us. We're thinking about signing it, but it takes a year to get the building built. We can't wait for that night. We'd have to commit to this now and we just want to know what your proposal would look like in comparison to that. Can we create a circumstance that actually rationalizes our early action and then the landlord might be more responsive? There's also another strategy here of depending on what the duration of the fixed extension term is, say it's a five-year renewal option, going to them and saying, hey, a five-year renewal option doesn't actually work for us because of these reasons. We need it to be seven years. Therefore, it's not feasible for us to exercise the renewal right. That's why we're in conversations with you now. So just coming up with reasons for them to make a change to their normal uh, practice is really helpful at bringing landlords to the table sooner. Brian, it looks like you had something to say too. Yeah, I would say that um, the 12 to 18 month notice period or nine months, if you can get it that tight, notice period for renewal options is in this environment for the reasons we've talked about on many podcasts typically isn't the right timeline to be able to run a strategic process to evaluate staying or going so uh, first question is is like any owner that's 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 forcing you to exercise or to waive it um, hopefully you're well you're out well ahead of that date and um, you know it should is that really the person you want to be you, you want a relationship with because you know there is a negotiation but at the end of the day your partner is with that landlord and uh, you know my success has been building that partnership in in focusing our clients on you know is this the right landlord and if you start to really look have them look at it from the perspective of do I want to be working with this landlord what else is what other areas are they going to try to try to capitalize on their leverage and and push us is this the right 
relationship that I'm, that I'm entering in or continuing it. And if you start to get the clients to think that way, one, it gives them leverage. It gives you leverage to go to the landlord and say, look, you know, we're, we don't care anymore because this isn't who we want to be working with anyway. Um, so you have an opportunity to keep a very good company and a very uh, dynamic company and a great client of yours if you treat us right. Uh, it just rubs many of my clients the wrong way if somebody came and tried to use that date as uh, you know a hard wall against uh, our ability to operate our business properly. Can, can I just add really quickly, I, I, we never really established the baseline. We're all talking in the same way about renewal options, but here, here's what I typically say. Like I always want to have a renewal option and I rarely want to actually exercise it uh, because the problem is you commit to the building before you know what that rent is going to be. And yes, there's a baseball arbitration process, but you, once you exercise a renewal option, you can't unring that bell. So I'd much rather have some indication from the landlord where that rent's going to be before I make a commitment for another five years in the space. It his Generally speaking, that's true, but I've been successful in the past year negotiating renewal option language that allows us to see that first volley and then um, effectively back out, which is not very typical. Um, but And I wouldn't say I'm able to achieve that for industrial clients, but for my office clients over the past year, given the state of the market, that's something that I've never been able to achieve before and I'm able to get now, which is pretty awesome. So imagine being able to exercise your renewal options, see what the landlord's first volley is and being like, nah, I don't like that. And then execute plan B. Okay, that is time. That is going to conclude episode eight of the Corporate Real Estate Insider Podcast. This is the first episode of a multi-part series talking about navigating tough situations that you might find yourself in as a director of real estate. We will be back uh, in two weeks with part two of this series. Uh, thanks so much for listening. And if you have any topics that you're dealing with right now, any challenges you're going through or that you want our thoughts on, please email us uh, at podcast at the CREinsider.com and we will answer your questions. Thanks so much. <laughs>